Uh, part two of hyperbolic okay, so thanks for coming back. Um, right, so I'm going to keep talking about hyperbolically embedded subgroups today, and the main goal is to Very talk nice about uh, this theorem, which I mentioned yesterday. So yesterday, we Very defined nice acylindrically hyperbolic groups. That's what this AH stands for, acylindrically nice. hyperbolic, and we defined hyperbolically embedded subgroups, and I said that the reason that uh, we were... Mute, whatever's. Um, I said that the reason I introduced both those topics is they're actually equivalent. So a group is acylindrically hyperbolic if and only if it contains a non-degenerate hyperbolically embedded subgroup. So I want to talk about how you get both directions of this equivalence. So I want to start with, if you know your group is acylindrically hyperbolic, how can you find a non-degenerate hyperbolically embedded subgroup? So let's start with one implies two. So I should say that there's, um, for both directions of this, it's not both directions, neither direction is obvious. Let me say that. There's a fair amount of work that goes into both directions. So I'm not going to prove every detail of both directions. We're going to take some things as black boxes, but I want to give you the general idea of how you get from one to the other. Um, okay, so the first one, so, um, if you start with an acylindrically hyperbolic group, the way you get a hyperbolically embedded subgroup relies on a proposition. And this proposition has, well, the original proposition is due to uh, Damani, Pierardel, and Osin. And then there are some refinements and other versions of this, uh, one given by Hall and one given by Antolin, Minassian, and Sisto. And what this proposition does is give you a way to find hyperbolically embedded subgroups given an action on a hyperbolic space, not necessarily an acylindrical action, but just an action on a hyperbolic space. So the proposition says that if you have an action on a hyperbolic space, so all of my actions are going to be by isometries, but there's no other assumption on this action, and you have a subgroup H of G, then if the subgroup, and actually let's say that this is a finitely generated subgroup, then uh, if H is quasi-isometrically embedded in X via an orbit map and uh, an orbit of H is geometrically separated, <laughs> in X, then the subgroup hyperbolically embeds in G with respect to some generating set X, sorry, some generating set S, where um, this is a generating set so that the Cayley graph of G with respect to S is quasi-isometric equivariantly quasi-isometric to the space X. And this equivariant quasi-isometry um, comes from the Milner-Schwartz lemma. And sorry, I guess I should say this is a co-bounded action. I almost never think about non-co-bounded actions. So I forget to write it down. So there's one assumption on the action other than isometric. Okay, so uh, Jean-Pierre mentioned the Milner-Schwartz lemma at the end of the, uh, his mini course yesterday. So, uh, he stated it for Cayley graphs, like if you have two Cayley graphs of a group with finite generating sets, then they're quasi-isometric. There's a more general statement that says, if you have a um, co-bounded action by isometries on a metric space, then there is a possibly infinite generating set of the group so that the Cayley graph of the group with respect to that generating set is equivariantly quasi-isometric to the space that you started with. Right? So given this co-bounded action on a hyperbolic space, I get some sort of some infinite generating set kind of for free from Milner Schwartz. And it turns out that this subgroup hyperbolically embeds in the group with respect to that particular uh, generating set. So, okay, Jean-Pierre also helpfully defined a quasi-isometric embedding, right? So this says, if you look at a finite generating set of H and you look at the Cayley graph of H and you look at an orbit of H in X, then those two have the same large scale geometry. Right, those distances differ by uh, a multiplicative and an additive error. And then geometrically separated. So Francois talked briefly about this yesterday, but let me just write a more formal definition down because we're gonna sort of use it in what follows. This says that uh, for all 
epsilon greater than zero, there exists an R greater than or equal to zero, uh, such that if um, an epsilon neighborhood of H, and I'll just, I'm thinking about this of an orbit of H, so I'm gonna fix some base point in my space and look at an orbit of H. So an epsilon neighborhood of H intersect an epsilon neighborhood of some um, translate of H. So if this intersection has diameter at least R, then T is in H. So in other words, these two cosets are actually the same coset. So in other words, if you, I think I'm just drawing this subgroup as like a, as a line, if you have some um, orbit of H here and you have some translate of that orbit of H. So this geometric separation says that the amount of time that they stay close to each other. So within an epsilon neighborhood of each other is bounded by R. So this distance is less than R. So these kind of diverge quickly. Outside of a uniform neighborhood, the two sub, the two translates uh, diverge. Okay, are there questions about the statement of this? Is the conclusion that the Cayley graph is equal to x? Is that part of the conclusion? It's well, it's part of the conclusion. The main part of the conclusion is that H hyperbolically embeds in G, but it hyperbolically embeds in G with respect to the particular relative generating set, which gives this quasi-isometry from uh -huh. Schwartz. So the, yeah, the, the fact that you have this quasi-isometry just comes from the fact you have a co-bounded action, but this S shows up here, which is the important part. Other questions? Okay, great. So this gives us a way, this is I'm not going to prove, but this gives us a way to find hyperbolically embedded subgroups. This is not the only way to find hyperbolically embedded subgroups. And maybe I'll just point out that if you are quasi-isometrically embedded in a hyperbolic space, then you are hyperbolic. So all of the hyperbolically embedded subgroups that you can find using this particular proposition will be hyperbolic, hyperbolically embedded subgroups. So it's not giving you all hyperbolically embedded subgroups, but it gives you some. Okay, so how do we use this proposition to go from one to two? Okay, so we know that the group is acylindrically hyperbolic. That's our assumption. So that implies that we have a, a non-elementary acylindrical action on a hyperbolic space, okay? Um, and since this action is non-elementary, there are infinitely many independent loxodromic isometries in this action, right? So in particular, there is a single loxodromic element um, here. So there is a G and G that is loxodromic in this action. So remember to be loxodromic means that it acts as translation along an axis. And this was part of the definition of this action being non-elementary. Okay, so then um, a result by Damani, Girardel, and Osen, which I'm gonna abbreviate to DGO because I'm gonna write it a million times during today's talk because really all of the foundation and the definition of hyperbolically embedded subgroups is due to them. So uh, Damani, Girardel, and Osen show that there exists a unique maximal virtually cyclic subgroup denoted E of G containing the subgroup generated by G, okay? So this is a fact using proved using hyperbolic geometry. So this is true in hyperbolic groups. Every infinite order element in a hyperbolic group is contained in a unique maximal virtually cyclic subgroup. So this is the analog using this acylindrical action on a hyperbolic space, you can get the same property. Okay, and um, what we're gonna show is that this subgroup E of G is hyperbolically embedded in G. So this will be our non-degenerate hyperbolically embedded subgroup. And the claim is that this subgroup E of G satisfies the assumptions of this proposition. Right, so it's virtually cyclic, it's finitely generated. So what we need to know is that that subgroup is quasi-isometrically embedded and geometrically separated, right? So for the purposes of this, I'm gonna kind of ignore the fact that it's this virtually cyclic subgroup containing uh, the, the cyclic subgroup generated by G. I'm, I'm just gonna think about the cyclic subgroup generated by G because it's easier um, and there's really no difference between the two. 
So, uh, well, okay, so this cyclic subgroup is quasi-isometrically embedded because it's a loxodromic element, right? The definition of a loxodromic cell element said that you had a QI embedding of the integers into your space where n mapped to g to the n x, right? So that gives you a quasi-isometric embedding of this cyclic subgroup into your space via the orbit map. So that first condition is satisfied just by the way we chose the element g. Um, and so far we haven't used this really acylindricity except to know that there's the existence of an element G. Um, so the claim is that it's actually geometrically separated. And that's where acylindricity comes in. So if you have a loxodromic isometry in an acylindrical action, the axes that these elements translate along, those the translates of, of that axis will be geometrically separated. Um, so E of G is geometrically separated in X, so what's the sketch of the idea? Well, okay, here is, this is like a QI embedding of the cyclic subgroup. So this is some orbit, right? So G translates along this. And suppose that it's not geometrically separated. So suppose that they stay together for a very long time. That means that there's another axis that kind of looks like this. So this is a translate, right? And okay, so I'm gonna sort of sweep some of the constants under the rug, but so give me an epsilon. A cylindricity gives an R, which is like two points that are at least R apart in the definition of a cylindricity. If I sort of use that same R as this R for geometric separation. So I can take two points on this axis, X and Y, that are at least R apart and are close to this other translate. Right, like so. Suppose that's my R for geometric separation. Then, okay, intuitively, but not precisely, what happens? Well, I want to know. Um, so G translates along this axis, right? And so, if I translate a long distance by G, so I translate by some G to the I, and then I apply T. That's going to get me to this other coset. And then I translate back by g to the i. What have I done? Well, I've ended up close to where I started, right? I've kind of gone along the axis, I've jumped to another translate, and I've come back along that other axis. And by what I'm assuming that these axes are close right here, then I've actually ended up near where I started. So the entire set of elements, g to the i, t, g to the negative i, where i is in z, uh, moves x by at most epsilon, right? And then I can make the exact same argument starting with this point y, right? I'm assuming that you know at y, you're also close to the other translate. So I can go way, starting at y, I can do g to the i, jump down with t, and then come back by g to the i, and end up close to where I started. Right? So it actually moves x by less than epsilon and y by less than or equal to epsilon. So I found an infinite family of elements that move both of these points by at most epsilon, and that contradicts acylindricity. So um, I want to say that this, I'm going to put the word intuitively here, because this is not quite all the details of the argument. This is how you should think about it, right? There are some sort of subtleties that come up when you try to do an argument like this, but this is the main idea. Yeah. Can the true action such as co-boundings? Can you say that you just pick some asymmetrical action, but you need a co Yeah, so you could look at, for example, like a, a uniform neighborhood of the orbit of G in the action if it's not co-bounded. So like ignore the part that G doesn't see because the argument here actually is only dealing with things that are in the orbit. Yeah, but you're right. So there are some technicalities. Mm -hmm. There's something odd about this picture, uh, yeah. right? Because if, if G is stabilizing the axis on top, then the stabilizer of the axis on the bottom is going to be a conjugate of G. Right? Yeah, that's right, which is why it's intuitively. Yeah, that's absolutely right. So like I'm sweeping lots of technicalities under the rug on purpose. So yeah, it's absolutely true. So G translates along this axis G conjugated by T translates along that axis. 
but you can sort of, so there's lots of details here that I was purposefully hoping, no, well, that's right. Homework exercise, work out the details of this. Um, yeah, okay. that's also, I mean, the other thing is like T, you know, doesn't, T could take this point X to like way back here on the axis, right? It doesn't have to move it to the close point. So there's like lots of sort of geometry hidden in this intuitive argument. Yeah. Can you get away with less than this one sitting here? Yeah, you can get away with a lot less and don't spoil it because I'm going to talk about it in a minute. Okay. Um, other objections, questions? Yeah, uh, Carolyn. Detail? Do you, do you? Okay. Oh. What? Yeah, Carolyn, uh, do, for, so for this argument, do you need, do you use that the translation length of G is uniform, is, is like uniformly bounded below to get a uniform R, or, or this is not important here? Do I use that? The translation length of G is bounded below from, bounded away from zero to get a uniform R, or is this not important for this argument? Uh, it will not be important to this argument because I'm not saying that like, I'm not saying that G translates X past y or anything, just that g translates it to the right by some amount, and these axes are infinite, so like it doesn't matter how far it translates. Okay. So that I think is actually not one of the details that I skipped. Okay, um, so this says that by the proposition, we have a hyperbolically embedded subgroup, right, minus details. Um, and it's, okay, so it's non-degenerate. Non-degenerate means that it is an infinite subgroup that is also not equal to the group. So it's infinite because it contains an infinite cyclic subgroup. It's not equal to the group because since the group is acylindrically hyperbolic, it is not virtually cyclic by definition, and this is virtually cyclic. Okay, so this is non-degenerate. Okay, um, so more generally, this doesn't use the full strength of acylindricity. So one of the things that's very strong about the definition of acylindricity is when you're counting the elements that move these two points by at most epsilon, there is a uniform finiteness there. And what this is, what I found is infinitely many elements. It's not just that I found too many, like I found too, and too many, but infinitely many too many, right? Like there's no, no contradicting uniformness in this argument. So you I really don't need a full acylindrical action here. There's, um, so more generally, um, you don't need that. So you don't need the group acting acylindrically on a hyperbolic space. If you have a group acting on a hyperbolic space, um, and in this action, there's an element that is loxodromic. and also satisfies a condition called WPD, which I'll tell you what that means in a minute, um, and a WPD element, then you also get this virtually cyclic subgroup that will also hyperbolically embed into the group with the same relative generating set in both of these conditions. This is the relative generating set coming from Milner-Schwartz. So what is WPD? Well, WPD is, um, exactly the condition you need to make this argument work, right? Acylindricity is stronger, but WPD says basically this doesn't happen. So WPD says that uh, for all epsilon greater than zero, there exists a capital N greater than or equal to zero, such that for all points in your space and for all little n greater than or equal to capital N, the number of group elements that move X by at most epsilon and move G to the little n X by at most epsilon is finite. Okay, so there's two ways that this definition is weaker than the action being acylindrical. Uh, one is that I'm only requiring a set to be finite rather than uniform finite. And the other is I'm not looking at any two points in my space. I'm looking at two points that differ by a power, a high power of a loxodromic. So really what I'm exactly looking at is instead of any two X and Y, I'm looking at X and Y like in that picture, right? So one of them, there's like, they lie on some axis of G, some translate of an axis of G. So the way you should think about WPD is this is like a weak notion or maybe not weak, but like a non-uniform acylindricity 
but it's only along the axis of the loxodromic element G. So it's not a cylindricity for this entire action, just in this one direction that's picked out by the loxodromic isometry. And this is really the condition you need to make this argument work. Right? Um, so what this more generally statement says is that if you have a group acting on a hyperbolic space and you have a lock and it's not virtually cyclic and you have a loxodromic WPD element, then the group is acylindrically hyperbolic. This is usually how groups are proved to be acylindrically hyperbolic. So proving that an action is acylindrical is difficult, it's very difficult, and it's often just not done. Um, and so if you give me a group and I want to know if it's acylindrically hyperbolic or not, what I'm going to look for is an action on a hyperbolic space with a loxodromic WPD element. This is just easier to check. It's only in one direction, and I don't need any uniformity of my constants. So when that first day, yesterday, when I gave you a list of acylindrically hyperbolic groups, you might have noticed that for the first few, I gave you an acylindrical action, and then I stopped and just started writing the names of the groups. For many of those later ones where I didn't write the action, there is not a known natural acylindrical action associated to the group. So for example, out FN, it has actions on lots of hyperbolic complexes, None of them are known to be acylindrical. Some of them are known not to be acylindrical, but none of them are known to be acylindrical. So that's what I mean kind of by natural, like a, a graph that you already have associated to the group that um, in some sort of interesting way. Okay. Questions? Yeah. Sure. This is like sort of where the definition of hyperbolic embedded comes from and describe how these key I mean, you certainly can. You certainly can. It is more general than that because you don't have to be working with something like virtually cyclic for these um, or hyperbolic, but uh, there's no harm in that. Other questions? So the mapping class group on the curve graph is acylindrical. Um, for out FN, so it's, you're not going to look at outer space because it's not hyperbolic, um, but you can look at the free factor complex, the cyclic splitting complex, or the free splitting complex, for example. There's some other complexes that involve spheres and, well, there's a lot of them. I don't know all of them. Um, the action on the free splitting complex is known not to be acylindrical. The action on the cyclic splitting complex is unknown. The action on the free factor complex is unknown, but it is known for the free factor complex that every loxodromic isometry is a WPD element. So it's what's called a WPD action. Um, but in that proof of WPD for the different elements, the how finite this finite set is grows in that particular proof. It's not known if that's optimal, but in the proof of a WPD action, this finiteness grows. So you don't get any kind of uniformity in the WPD constants over all the different elements. Um, and those loxodromic WPD elements are exactly the uh, fully irreducible elements in out FN, which don't appear maybe or maybe not, we'll talk about at some point. Other questions? If you have a group, Sometimes, I think you said, sometimes it's not important to know exactly which space is the one of you to work okay. mm -hmm. But how is it is, say you know that this group splits over another bad subgroups. Um, how, is, how is it is that the action in the bus set field is asymmetrical? So it might be acylindrical. So if it splits over an almost malnormal subgroup, mm -hmm. then it will be acylindrical. Um, otherwise, so it might not be. Um, yeah, if it's malnormal, then it's too acylindrical. Yeah. Um, actually, even if it's almost malnormal, it's too acylindrical. If you have, I guess if you, yeah, I'm not going to try to get the constants right because I won't. Um, but yes, it's too acylindrical in that case. I mean, in general, if you have a splitting over, if it's, if it's acylindrically hyperbolic and it's splitting over something that's not almost malnormal, the action might not be acylindrical, but you might still have a loxodromic WPD element depending on a lot of things. Like you might have to, it might not be all elements, but you might be able to find one for which it's true. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it was general. Yeah, okay. Okay.
Um, so just one fact before I turn to the other direction of two implies one. Um, so if a group is acylindrically hyperbolic, then uh, there exists a unique maximal finite normal subgroup of the group. So if you look at all the finite normal subgroups ordered by subgroup inclusion, there's a unique maximal one. Um, and we denote it capital E of G, sometimes capital K of G, depending on the paper. Okay, so this just exists. And then the, um, the theorem that I wanna mention, this is also due to Damani, Gerardo and Osen. Um, so in this proof that I gave you, I found a, or I showed you how to find a virtually cyclic hyperbolically embedded subgroup. Uh, in general, if G is acylindrically hyperbolic, then uh, for all N, there exists a hyperbolically embedded subgroup of the form a free group on N generators, direct product with this finite subgroup. E of G. And intuitively, this free group comes from doing the same argument, not on a single loxodromic element, but on a set of N independent loxodromic elements. So N independent loxodromic elements, high enough powers of them will generate a free group by a ping pong lemma. And the real key here is that not that you get the free group, but that you get a direct product with this finite group. So you can kind of carefully choose these independent loxodromic isometries to get subgroups like this. And this is gonna be really useful because what we're gonna talk about tomorrow is a way to, um, in some cases, if you know some things about certain hyperbolically embedded subgroups, how to extend those results from the subgroup to the entire group. And we know a lot about free groups and we know a lot about free groups that doesn't change when you take the direct product with a finite group. So, you, so there's some things where you, if you know that they're true for free groups, you can show that they hold for all acylindrically hyperbolic groups. Yeah. Is that statement still true if you don't draw it with EFG? So you just get a free group? Oh, or like that's uh, yeah, hyperbolic embedded. Uh no, not necessarily, unless the group itself has trivial yeah. finite normal subgroup. Yeah. So there's and it's the difference between sort of the intuitive argument with the cyclic subgroup generated by G and what's actually hyperbolically embedded, which is this virtually cyclic one. Yeah. Okay. Let's talk about the other direction if there aren't other questions. So two implies one. So I wanna start with a hyperbolically embedded subgroup and I wanna build a non-elementary acylindrical action on a hyperbolic space. So this is the harder direction. And um, to understand it, I need to tell you some of the tools that you use to when you're studying hyperbolically embedded subgroups. So what are the main tools? There's really kind of one main tool, but I'll leave it plural. Um, okay, so we're interested in, like last time the graph, so let's say we have H and it hyperbolically embeds in G with respect to some generating set S. Right now we don't know that G is acylindrically hyperbolic, but we have this hyperbolically embedded subgroup. And we have this Cayley graph with the generating set S disjoint union H, and we know this is hyperbolic. Um, okay, so let's say that P is a path in this graph gamma. And we're gonna say that, always say the vertex it starts with is P minus, and the vertex it ends with is P plus. So this is a combinatorial path between vertices of the graph. Um, so if I have a path in a Cayley graph, each edge of this path is labeled by an element either of S or of H. Right? And that gives us a way to assign a label to a path. Right, We just concatenate the letters that are on each edge. So each path has a label, which we call label of P. Okay, so what I wanna do is sort of think of these two subsets of this generating set separately. So if I have a path in this Cayley graph, I wanna think Actually, what I really care about are the parts of the path that are labeled by elements of H, right? So I wanna think about where this path spends time in H versus where it's outside of H. So an H component 
of P is a maximal subpath of P labeled by H, by which I mean that every edge in this subpath is labeled by an element of H. Um, and then two H components are connected. And let's call these H components like Q1 and Q2. Um, they're connected if there exists a path C from a vertex of Q1 to a vertex of Q2 uh, with the label of C in H, right? So if I can get from Q1 to Q2 only by using edges labeled by H. Um, so, I mean, here's my Q1, here's my Q2. Q1 is always labeled by edges of H. Q2 is labeled by edges of H. And maybe I can find a path C like this, which is also labeled by edges of H then those two are connected. So every label in this picture is in H. And what that means is that Q1 and Q2, algebraically, it means they lie in the same coset of H, right? Any, any path labeled by elements of H lives in some coset of H. And if you can get to some other path labeled by elements of H only staying inside of H, then they're in the same coset. So this means that this whole picture is happening inside one particular coset of H. So this is like an algebraic way to think about cosets in this graph, or a, like a combinatorial way to think about cosets in the graph. And then we say that an H component is isolated if it's not connected to any other H component. So that's like saying it's the only subpath that passes through that particular coset. Mm -hmm. This C doesn't like this. Yeah, so okay, so Q1 and Q2 don't actually have to be H components of the same path. Same path. They're just, they can, and they can be the whole paths themselves. So you just have one path labeled by H, another path labeled by H, and some path between those. Yeah, thank you for clarifying. So an H component is isolated if it's not connected to any other H component. Okay. Uh, so here is the key lemma that we're going to use. This is really anytime you have a hyperbolically embedded subgroup and you want to use it to prove something, this is what you do. This is due to Damani, Gerard, and Nosen. So there exists a constant C such that for any n gone P with geodesic sides, in gamma, so I'm taking an n-gon in gamma, so I'm concatenating geodesics to form a closed loop. Um, and any isolated H component Q of P, the d hat distance between the initial point of that H component and the terminal point of that H component is at most C times the number of sides in the polygon, right? So here's some, this is happening in gamma. Here's some n gone where I'm calling this entire path P, but I'm just broken up into four geodesics. And maybe there's some H component here, for example. And so one thing to notice, this is if this is a geodesic side, a geodesic, this top side, then um, an H component is just gonna be an edge, right? Because every pair of points in a coset of H is connected by an edge. So if, there, if I had like a path of length six or something, all of whose labels were in H, then I could have just jumped from the beginning to the end with a single edge, right? So there's some E that is in H. So here, I'm thinking the label of E, is in H. And uh, suppose that this is the only, like this is not connected to any other H component, right? So this is like saying the coset that this edge is in, the coset of H that it's in, doesn't intersect the other sides of this 
to this uh, rectangle. Then this says that the d hat length from between the two vertices, e minus and e plus, is less than or equal to four times c. Okay, so if you have a polygon and it just intersects a coset on one side, then it can't intersect that coset very much with respect to the d hat metric. Okay. Um, and the other sort of important lemma, which I referenced last time, is that there is sort of a relationship between the d hat metric and a word metric on H, or like an extended word metric on H. So in general, there exists a finite uh, subset Z of H, not necessarily a generating set a priori, but just some finite subset um, and a constant capital B such that the uh, extended word metric with respect to Z is less than or equal to B times the D hat metric. So I'm just gonna abbreviate it and not put any entries there. But these are both metrics on H. So one reason that it's just a finite subset and not a generating set is I've made no assumptions of finite generation anywhere here. Um, if H is a finitely generated subgroup, then you could add finitely many elements to Z and assume that this is a finite generating set, right? But it's a little bit more general than that. Okay, so that's the technology that we need. Um, so now I have a hyperbolically embedded subgroup. I want to create an acylindrical action on a hyperbolic space that's non-elementary. How do I do it? Well, there's a natural guess, right? There is one hyperbolic space associated to that hyperbolically embedded subgroup. So the natural first guess is that the action of G on the Cayley, so again, we're assuming H is hyperbolically embedded in G with respect to S. Um, the guess is that G acting on the Cayley graph of G with respect to S disjoint union H um, is acylindrical, okay? So that like we've got a hyperbolic space, maybe we don't have to do anything and maybe that's acylindrical. So it's certainly possible that that's acylindrical, uh, but it's not always true. If it is acylindrical, um, you can say that the subgroup is strongly hyperbolically embedded in the group, but it might not be true. And there's an exercise uh, that I put for the problem session where uh, you can show directly that there is a case where this action is not acylindrical. Um, but what you'll see in that example, which just in the interest of time, I'm not gonna talk about in any detail here, but what you'll see in this example is that, well, this action might not be acylindrical, um, but actually, if you make S bigger, you can make that action acylindrical. So it turns out that this is, this is a good guess, but only if you think of it as a starting point. So you can take this S, increase it by typically infinitely, well, if it's not acylindrical, by infinitely many elements, and get a new relative Cayley graph like this on which the action is acylindrical. So let me tell you how you increase that generating set. Um, so I guess I'll write the theorem. So if we have H that hyperbolically embeds in G with respect to S, then there exists a subset Y of G such that first, S is contained in Y. Second, H hyperbolically embeds in G with respect to Y. So when I increase the size of the relative generating set, I don't break the fact that the subgroup is hyperbolically embedded. And the action of G on the Cayley graph of G with respect to Y disjoint union H is acylindrical, right? So if you give me like a not so good relative generating set with respect to which the subgroup is hyperbolically embedded, I or OSIN can build you a better one. Right, there's a way to build a better one. Okay, so I'm definitely not gonna prove this whole thing because it's a lot. I wanna tell you what the bigger generating set is and um, maybe just give you an idea of how you use these uh, tools from hyperbolically embedded subgroups to show that you get an acylindrical action. Okay, so for any two elements of the group, let's let S of S comma G, F comma G be the set of cosets of H such that there exists a geodesic 
in gamma, which is the same S disjoint union H Cayley graph that we've been looking at the whole time, um, that there exists a geodesic. And that geodesic has an H component of D hat length at least 3C. C is the constant from the key lemma, the same C. Okay, so these are called the essentially penetrated cosets. So the generating set Y is the set of elements Y in the group such that the set of essentially penetrated cosets from the identity to Y is empty which means that there is no geodesic from one to Y in this relative Cayley graph that spends a long time in any coset of H. So you should think of this as like um, the directions in this Cayley graph that are orthogonal to the hyperbolically embedded subgroup. Like you don't spend a long time in any coset of this hyperbolically embedded subgroup when you go to these elements. Right, like you, you just kind of they totally avoid all the all the cosets of these hyperbolically embedded subgroups, or like essentially avoid all of them. So you're taking your space, this Cayley graph, with respect to this infinite generating set, and you're looking at all the directions that are like orthogonal to H, and you're crushing them down to one. Right, so distances that aren't seen by the hyperbolically embedded subgroups are collapsed. Um, so the this contains the generating set S that you started with, because if Y is in the generating set S that you started with, then the identity is connected to that element by an edge labeled by that element of S because it's a Cayley graph. So it doesn't have any H components at all. So it's in this set that doesn't essentially penetrate any cosets. The S, S, G, are the geodesics going from that to the it's, this, it's a set of cosets of H. So this is the collection of cosets of H so that there is a geodesic from F to G that spends a long time in that coset. Okay, so the claim is that the action on this Cayley graph is acylindrical. This Cayley graph with respect to Y is acylindrical. Um, and one fact that I'm just gonna leave as a black box is that there's a relationship between distances in the Cayley graph Y union H and the number of cosets that are essentially penetrated um, between F and G, okay? So just a fact, total black box, proof is a couple pages long, definitely can't do it in seven minutes. Um, but so uh, this is gonna be one of the main tools. And now I wanna show the action is acylindrical. So, Let's just fix a constant epsilon greater than or equal to zero. And let's suppose that we take two elements of our Cayley graph. Let's say, since the action, it's an isometric action, I can assume that one of them is the identity. So let's fix an element G in the group so that the distance in this Cayley graph, um, big, and here big is gonna be 18 epsilon plus 11. That's going to be the R in the definition of acylindricity. So it's like a very specific R. Um, and suppose that there's an element S in G so that the distance from one to F is less than or equal to epsilon and the distance from G to FG is less than or equal to epsilon in this Cayley graph I'm talking about. Okay, so my picture is I have two elements of my group that are far apart. So you should think of this as the R. And then I have an element F that moves the identity and moves G by at most epsilon, right? And so my goal to prove acylindricity is to show that there's only finitely many, uniformly finitely many such elements F. So again, leaving some black boxes, you can show there exists a coset of H that is essentially penetrated by the bottom side of the rectangle 
and the top side of the rectangle, but not the left side of the rectangle. Okay. And again, not going to give you all the details, but the picture then with the same rectangle is that there's a coset of H that intersects the top and the bottom. And it either doesn't intersect the left side at all, or if it does intersect the left side, the d hat distance of this H component over here is really small, right? This left side doesn't spend much time in that coset. Okay, and the idea is that we want to um, use this to bound the number of possible Fs. So we know that there's this H component that intersects the top and the bottom, or this coset that intersects the top and the bottom. So let's say the bottom part, the bottom geodesic enters the coset at U and the top geodesic enters the coset at V. Um, what I wanna do is write my element F as, well, I'm gonna decompose it. It's U times U inverse V times, let me just make sure I get the inverses in the right place, F inverse V inverse. That's just another way to write F. And what I'm doing is writing it as a concatenation of three paths. And right? I'm first going over to U, then up to V, and then back to F. What do I know? Um, I'm not gonna be able to give you all the details, but for each of these, I wanna bound the number of choices I have for U, the number of choices I have for U inverse V, and the number of choices for the third term. And the hardest part is bounding the number of choices you have for U inverse V. So I have two possible pictures. In the first picture, there's an edge from U to V because they're in the same coset of H, right? There's an edge labeled by H. And if I look, at the left-hand side, I have a quadrilateral, and this H component is isolated in the quadrilateral, right? Because in this configuration, it doesn't intersect the left side. So in this case, D hat from U to V uh, is less than or equal to 4C, right? Now, the D hat metric, H is proper with respect to the D hat metric. So there's only finitely many elements U inverse V that have the property that they have small D hat distance, right? So this uniformly bounds the number of elements U inverse V. In the second picture, okay, so there's still an H, there's still an edge from U to V, but it's not isolated in the left quadrilateral anymore. So we do something a little bit different. We have an edge from U to this component on the left and an edge from the component on the left to the right. And what we get is two triangles. And over here, we've got an H component that's isolated in a triangle. So this edge here has D hat less than or equal to three C, the same thing at the top, but we still have this piece in the middle, right? But in the middle, this coset that I chose doesn't essentially penetrate the left-hand side. So in fact, this piece on the left also has D hat distance bounded by 3C. And so in this case as well, the D hat distance between U and V um, is bounded. Now it's bounded by 9C. So since uh, H comma D hat is proper, uh, the number of choices for U inverse V is bounded uniformly bounded by the size of a uh, 9C ball about the identity in H, uh, which is finite. Okay, you also have to bound the number of choices for U and for F inverse V. So there's some work to be done there as well, which is actually where this other black box comes into play but I don't have time to go through the details of all of that. But so this is the idea. So I think what I want you to take away from it um, is two things. Uh, one of those two things is definitely not the details of the proof, right? One of those two things is that it's a combinatorial proof. 
right? I've taken, like, I'm trying to find this acylindrical action, but everything about this is a very combinatorial argument. I'm looking at paths, I'm looking at configurations of how paths are joined together, right? So hyperbolically embedded subgroups are a combinatorial tool. That's the first. And the second is the, I want you to take away the intuition of what the set Y is, right? So the set Y, you take this hyperbolically embedded subgroup and you add all the directions in the group that are orthogonal to Y. You crush those directions together. And that new action is acylindrical. Um, I'm happy to talk in more detail about any steps in this group. I know it was kind of a little bit fast at the end, but but it's a very combinatorial argument. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, other cases where I mean, like the school is in the action has a number of people to see a function like the WPD action. So cases that it has consequences rather than yes, I think that you couldn't have the action. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, um, there are hyperbolically embedded subgroups that you're sort of not going to see necessarily from WPD actions, um, I think. So, so I don't know off the top of my head, but I it seems to me that so WPD actions are very powerful, but somehow the lack of uniformity and the constants really doesn't give you as much control. So Sometimes there are things that are proven from having a WPD action, but it kind of goes through the fact that you know that the group is then acylindrically hyperbolic, and then you use facts for which the, a different acylindrical action was used. Um, but I would have to think more carefully about the results to see like exactly where that dependence comes from. But I do, my general impression is that some of the, some of the tools used when you study WPD actions are kind of like they're hidden tools that use the uniformity of constants in this other action. But I don't have examples off the top of my head. So the action of a sum of theory in the blackboard is not always as but is it always WPD? Is it always WPD? No, it's not. Actually, um, the example I gave you for the exercise section, uh, I'm fairly certain that uh, there are non WPD elements there as well. Yeah, actually, there, yeah, there should be non-WPD elements and the action isn't asylindrical. Yeah, that doesn't have to be the case. There could be a WPD element, but the action is just not asylindrical. Other questions? <laughs>